to Jed Smead. Uh, he recently retired after 25 years in the human services field, but remains a member of the Aquaba, the Heritage Associates, and affiliation with Nazareth College in Rochester. Smead has self-published two children's picture books, and a, as well as a collection of poetry. He has performed storytelling, his poetry, historical reenactments, and presented workshops and lectures at numerous schools, colleges, and venues all over New York State and beyond. In his preparations to portray Jermaine Wesley Logan, Sneed researched Logan for many years and at many sites. Today he will share what he learned in that search. Uh, please welcome Jed Sneed. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. I am really, really happy to be here. Um, for the second year in a row. Um, can we just give everyone associated with Neha a big round of applause? Uh, the um, talk that I'm going to do is entitled The Search for the Real Life of J.W. Bogan. Uh, this is the old one. You know what? That's the old one. I don't like that one. I was first formally introduced to Bishop Jermaine Wesley Logan on March 23rd, 2004. I received an email from Mr. Gregory Wilson, director of the Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania Underground Railroad Convention. Greg's email informed me that he was in the process of planning the Sugar Grove Underground Railroad Convention, which was to be held June 19, 2004. He stated that he was projecting to have performances by first-hand historians impersonating Frederick Douglass, Lewis G. Clark, William Wells Brown, Sally Holly, and Reverend J.W. Logan. At that point, I was familiar with Douglass and semi-familiar with William Wells Brown. I am sure that I had seen Reverend Logan's name before this request by Greg. I'm also sure that I hadn't paid much attention to the name as I was not sure how it was pronounced and what the individual had actually accomplished. Greg's email outlined that this would be a one-day event from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. in Sugar Grove, commemorating the 150th anniversary of the actual 1854 Sugar Grove Anti-Slavery Convention that Douglas had remarked in his newspaper as the crowning convention of them all. Greg offered me the role of Logan, and that I, if I accepted this opportunity, would be responsible for writing a 20-minute prepared piece for Logan to be, to be presented three times that day. And additionally, I would have to memorize a script that Greg had written that would be presented at the convention or the gathering of all the abolitionists that would be there that day that would take place at 1 p.m. and then again at 6 p.m. As I said earlier, when the email came to me, I was unfamiliar with Logan's life and accomplishments. <laughs> Panic said him. <laughs> this meant that I had less than three months to memorize a script written by someone I didn't know and research and write a 20-minute, one-man presentation for a historical character I currently had no knowledge of. So, of course, I said yes. <laughs> Further, in his email, Greg mentioned that the expectation was that 10,000 people from all over the state and country would descend upon tiny sugar grove, and that the governor of Pennsylvania was expected to be in attendance that day. This was the beginning of my search for the real life of J.W. Logan. The search continues to this day. I always loved words, and the written word especially. One of my favorite sayings is, words are the tools with which we think. And the more words that we know, the better world we can create. As long as I can remember, I have been an avid reader of all types of books. I grew up in the woods of Wayne County, New York, East Williamson and South Soda specifically. And in fact, coming down here, I was reminded of East Williamson and South Soda coming through, what's the little towns? What's the little towns around here? Coming down, uh, yeah, Morrisville, Cass, 
Yeah, all those little towns really put me in the mind of how I grew up. Very cool. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of distractions, and I did have a lot of free time on my hands. When I was in elementary school, I would get a pass and go to the library and just wander, picking up books that had interesting colors. I started writing poetry, um, what some might call poetry, in middle school. By 2004, I had self-published five chapbooks of poetry and was a regular on the coffee house circuit in and around Rochester, performing, reading my work, basically anywhere there was an audience. I was also called upon from time to time to share my thoughts as a lecturer, workshop presenter, and on various subjects and objects that impacted the African American youth and residents living in Rochester, Monroe, and surrounding counties. In the mid-1990s, I'd become aware of and decided to join the Black Storytelling League of Rochester, New York. The league had been formed by Dr. David Anderson Sankofa and others as a way to promote and care for the oral tradition of African American people. The league practiced what we call edutainment, educating our audiences to appreciate African and African American culture, but done so in an entertaining way. As I sat at the feet of these storytellers and learned the art of storytelling, I learned the freedom of not being tied down to the words of a poem or a speech. This freedom was liberating and intoxicating. I have shared, only half jokingly, in storytelling workshops that I've done, that the important thing in telling a story is learning the first line and the last line. And if you, get, and if you forget something in the middle, you make it up. <laughs> in 1998, I belonged to a group of concerned citizens of Rochester that decided to form AQUALA, the Heritage Associates. The purpose of AQUALA would be to specifically present the Underground Railroad and abolitionist history of Rochester, New York to students, adults, and visitors to our city. AQUALA means welcome in the West African Twi, or Akan language of Ghana. Through Aquaba, I became comfortable reenacting historical personalities and immersed in the telling of our story with fidelity. The telling of our story with fidelity. What this meant to the members of Aquaba was that we individually and collectively were responsible for researching, debating, and presenting historically correct engaging and enlightening reenactments of historical persons and events. By 2004, Aquaba had established itself as a premier tour guide organization and presenters of the Afro-Rochester legacy. By 2004, I had done or been part of historical reenactments of Shields Green, William Parker, Reverend Thomas James, Austin Stewart, the Fist Jubilee singers, Sunjata, Thurgood Marshall, Fannie Lou Hamer, and others in presentations of Quapa had provided. But I had not, nor had I had to research the life and legacy of a man who operated one of the most open depots on the Underground Railroad in the country. A man who published his calling card in the newspaper, informing all who could read of his activities in support of fleeing property a man who lived only 70 miles east of Rochester for most of his adult life, a man who to this day I regard as the premier example of what it means to stake one's ground and have faith in the Lord, namely the Reverend Jermaine Wesley Logan. My search for the real life of J.W. Logan began with Google, and of course I found online Logan's biography, the Reverend J.W. Logan as a slave and as a free man, a narrative of real life. It was in the Documenting the American South website and I downloaded it. This website is a wonderful resource for any researcher interested in slave narratives and Southern life before, during, and after the Civil War. I also found a narrative of Lewis G. Clark, another individual who would be portrayed in Sugar Grove that year on this website and downloaded it. I became immersed in Logan's biography. I never personally had qualms over whether Logan wrote the entire book or not. 
To me, it was obvious that there was more than one point of view and more than one voice being expressed in the book. This was a biography, not an autobiography. This also, for me, did not call into question the veracity of what was written. At this point in my quest, I was looking for the general contours of Logan's life, and this book was my beginning place. Logan's voice, to me, was the storyteller. The other voice, whom I later found out to be his friend, John Thomas, was the philosopher. This did not bother me at all because I, began, I became engaged with the story of Logan's life. The philosophizing was a distraction. I began to read this book to draw near to a man who spoke clearly and forthrightly about the injustices of slavery the loss of loved ones and acquaintances, the finding of one's self and purpose in life, a man who spoke boldly of not only his right, but his obligation to claim his humanity in the face of societal, political, and religious impediments. I found more information on Logan on the internet. It seemed to me that Logan was everywhere and was a friend or confidant of anyone who was someone in the Underground Railroad or anti-slavery movement of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. I asked myself, who was this man who spoke with such authority, determination, conviction, clarity of purpose, and insight? Who was this man who had been under my radar for so many years, but obviously was respected and welcomed in the most inner of inner circles of the abolitionist movement? Who was this man of action, not just words and pomp? Who was this ex-slave from Tennessee, only somewhat literate, but boldly claiming and living out his manhood on his own terms and testifying to his God-given right and responsibility to define that manhood against any who would trespass against it? I soon discovered his long and enduring relationships with Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Beriah Green, William Still, John Brown, Samuel Ringgold Ward, Harriet Tubman, Garrett Smith, Reverend Samuel May, and lesser known but just as important abolitionists and reformers. I found Logan's famous October 4th, 1850 speech to the citizens of Syracuse in reaction to the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. <laughs> I was astounded. Most of this speech was designed to stir up those in attendance to resist the implementation of the Fugitive Slave Act in Syracuse. But a significant stance was taken by Logan regarding his status as a fugitive slave himself. He stated in part, long ago, I was beset by over prudent and good men and women to purchase my freedom. Nay, I was frequently importuned to consent that they purchase it and present it as an evidence of their partiality to my person and character. My heart recoiled from the proposal. I owe my freedom to the God who made me and who stirred me to claim it against all other beings in God's universe. I received my freedom from heaven, and with it came the command to defend my title to it. I have long since resolved to do nothing and suffer nothing that can in any way imply that I am indebted to any power but the Almighty for my manhood and personality. <laughs> this was a deciding act of independence that, for me, separated Reverend Logan from many of the other ex-slave abolitionists and agitators of his time. Logan's insistence that no one be allowed to pay any man for his freedom put his freedom and his liberty in jeopardy. Essentially, Logan's position was his personality, pure and simple, separated him from being hogtied and taken back into slavery. And for Logan, this was sufficient. Upon reading this speech back in 2004, as is true today, I thought to myself, I am a black man. 
living in an imperfect America, a country which has not dealt squarely, fairly, or honestly with its racial legacy. What kind of black man did it take to take a stand like this in America in 1850? I asked myself, after reading Logan, Logan's Declaration of Independence, October 4th, 1850, had any other African American spoken as clearly, as directly to the powers that be, that not only was he or she not afraid of them, but that he or she would fight with and by whatever means were necessary to maintain their rights and liberty. David Walker came to mind, but he was born free and never knew personal slavery. Frederick Douglass came to mind, but as is well known, he allowed friends from England to purchase his freedom. Nat Turner and other insurrectionists and leaders of slave revolts knew slavery firsthand, but were unable, or perhaps unwilling, to rally white support for their efforts. Martin Delaney was born free. Perhaps Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X wrote and spoke and lived as adamantly about African American equality and rights as Logan. But living in the 1960s, they could not be claimed legally the property of another. None of them could have been legally arrested, incarcerated, denied the ability to testify in their own defense, and tried and possibly returned to a state and order that did not recognize their humanness, but saw them only as property. As part of my preparation to present my one man prepared piece of Logan for Sugar Grove that June, I meditated on the thought of what did it take to escape an environment of violence with one's humanity intact and thereafter acquire education, property, a family and friends, and, and impress the citizens of a city like Syracuse that they should join you in denouncing and make null and void a federal law duly passed by the government of the United States of America. I began to see that Logan lived the principle that allegiance to God is man's greatest command. <laughs> I began to understand who I was being asked to impersonate. I found the 1860 letters of correspondence between Logan and his former so-called owner, Sarah Logue. Mrs. Logue demanded money from Logan, $1,000, or she threatened to sell her rights to him and informed him that she had an interested buyer. She wrote him that she had to sell his brother and sister and 12 acres of land because he had ran away. In his written reply to Mrs. Logue, Logan indignantly called her wretched and defiantly chastised her for selling his siblings. He informed her that, and this is a quote, human rights were mutual and reciprocal, and if you take someone's liberty and life, you forfeit your own liberty and life. These letters were widely reprinted in the contemporary press. The tenor and boldness of his statements informed me as to how Reverend Logan must be presented. <laughs> Let me be honest. I was also looking for his flaws, his shortcomings, his weaknesses. I am leery of leaders, pontificators, and or eloquent speech makers who do not back up their words with their lives. I have become a bit jaded and accustomed to heroes with major character flaws. And I expected, as I continued to research and uncover information, to find Logan soon. My search continues to this day to uncover Logan's flaws. I would never suggest that I have exhausted all the research and information that is available on Logan, but what I have uncovered to date suggests him to have been trustworthy, honest, and faithful to his wife and friends. Of course, he had friction with others. Samuel Ringwald Ward, Susan B. Anthony, members of his own church, and even Sister Harriet Tubman. <laughs> but who doesn't have friction 
in the business of being active and engaged. As I continue to read Logan's biography and gather information on his activities and travels, the more I uncover of his interactions with his community, his church, both the congregations he was responsible for and the AME Zion governing organization. And the more I found on what his contemporaries said of him, the more I began to believe that here was a man who was worthy of respect and awe. And it appeared that most of his contemporaries, at least those who believed in the, in the eradication of slavery, the equality of man, etc., gave him his due respect. In short, it appeared to me that he talked the talk and walked the walk. Perhaps some of you in attendance this afternoon aren't familiar with the man of whom I've been speaking. So please allow me to quickly share a brief overview of Reverend Logan's life and work. Perhaps some of you who are in attendance this afternoon are unfamiliar, then I started that, right? Oh, here we go. Dr. Carol Hunter, who presented a wonderful lecture on Logan last year at Nahawk Symposium, in her work to set the captives free, the Reverend Jermaine Wesley Logan and the Struggle for Freedom in Central New York, 1835 to 1872, corrects the place name of Logan's birth to be near Mans Kurz Creek. And the arrow, if you see there's a little um, arrow, the red arrow points to Mans Kurz Creek. Instead of the Mans Coles Creek, Logan writes about in his biography. I still use Mans Coles Creek in my presentations because this is how it appears in the biography. Logan was born a slave in Tennessee somewhere between 1809 and 1814. As was usual with a child born into slavery, his exact birth date or year, birth year, was not recorded as far as Logan knew. Logan, for reasons still unknown to me, decided to celebrate his birthday on February 5th. When Logan's mother, Jane, was a child, she remembered living in the free state of Ohio with a Mr. McCoy. One day when she was about six or seven years of age, she was kidnapped by slave traders and eventually sold to the Logan family who lived 16 miles northeast of Nashville, Tennessee. The Logan family at that time consisted of three brothers, Manasseh, Carnes, and David Logan, and their widowed mother. When the Logan family purchased Jane, they changed her name to Cherry. Eventually, the youngest of the Lowell brothers, David, took Cherry to be his mistress and had at least four children with her. David was the second child born of this union, but he was the first boy. When a slave, Reverend J.W. Logan, was known only as Jarm. Comparatively, Jarm's treatment as a slave while living with David was mild. He called David's mother Granny. He slept at times in David's bed. He ate at their table. He was promised that he would never be sold, and upon reaching his 21st birthday, he would be set free. Because of financial problems around 1827, <laughs> David sold Cherry, Jarm, and his brother and sisters to Manasseh Logue, his brother, who had moved to Maury County in the southern part of Tennessee, near the Tom Bigby River. John was about 14 years of age, and this was the first time in his life that he was used as a field slave. With Cherry's help, he learned to be a field hand, but never resigned himself to being a slave. After many brutal incidences, Logan decided to run away from slavery. He and his best friend John Farney, with the help of a young white man they paid money to, made plans, and on Christmas Eve, 1834, they rode away from slavery on ten and Tennessee on horseback. After months of getting lost, almost starving, and being recaptured, Logan and Farney finally made it to Detroit, Michigan. They both crossed over to Windsor, Canada, and to Freedom, but John Farney decided to go back to the livery, livery stable in Detroit where his horse was. The owners of the livery, believing he was an escaped slave, attempted to keep his horse as they felt he wouldn't dare complain to anyone. 
Logan waited several days, but never saw John Farney again. Logan spent three years in Canada learning to become independent, and he bought land and saved his money. He learned to read and write, and eventually took the name Germaine Wesley Logan to be known by. Logan moved to St. Catharines and purchased a house before returning to the United States. In 1837, Logan moved to Rochester, New York, and worked at the Rochester House Hotel as a waiter and porter. From 1839 to 1841, Logan attended the Oneida Institute in Whitesboro, New York. The school was integrated with white, black, and red students and was led by Reverend Beriah Green. Logan first professed religion while attending the Oneida Institute and joined the AME Zion Church in nearby Utica, New York. Hmm. Logan met Caroline Elizabeth Story of Bus Busti, New York, in Utica, New York, while he was teaching Sunday school. They were married in 1840. Logan moved to Syracuse, New York, to teach and minister to the colored people of the city, and Caroline joined him in Syracuse in 1841. Logan's first pastorate was in Bath, New York, in 1843. He held successive pastorates in Ithaca, Syracuse, and Troy, New York. Logan rose through the ranks of the AME Zion Church and was ordained a presiding elder in 1848. Concurrent to his church work, Reverend Logan became a sought-after anti-slavery speaker and stumped for the Liberty Party in the 1844 and 1848 elections. Eventually, the Logans purchased a home at 293 East Genesis C Street at the corner of Pine in Syracuse. This residence became an active depot on the Underground Railroad. Logan states in his biography that he and his wife aided some 1,500 slaves, fugitives, during the operation of this depot. As I mentioned previously, in October 1850, Logan rallied the citizens of Syracuse to effectively annul the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and make Syracuse an open city. This means that escaping slaves who had made their way to Syracuse would not be returned into slavery, and they would be aided and abetted by the citizens of Syracuse. On October 1, 1851, Logan and other members of the Vigilance Committee of Syracuse along with approximately 2,500 citizens rallied in the streets of Syracuse to free William Jerry Henry, who had been arrested and incarcerated under the Fugitive Slave Law. Logan and the citizens of Syracuse forcefully removed Jerry from the police station where he was being held by battering down the door of the jail. Jerry was hidden in various homes in Syracuse for a few days before being sent on his way to Mexico, New York, and then he traveled to Oswego, New York, and across Lake Ontario to Kingston, Ontario, across Lake Ontario to on Kingston, Ontario, and Freedom. The United States government attempted to make examples of the rescuers of Jerry, and many of them, including Logan, were indicted. Logan, against his will, but to satisfy his wife and friends, left the United States in October 1851 and went to St. Catharines, Canada. Logan was never tried on the indictment. He returned to the U.S. in the spring of 1852 and resumed his work on the Underground Railroad, in the AME Zion Church, and in the Color Convention Movement. Logan was a supporter of women's rights and the full and immediate end of slavery. Once the Civil War broke out and after President Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, Logan became a successful recruiter for the Union Army. After the Civil War ended, Logan traveled south to Tennessee, setting up schools and churches and to minister to the newly freed men and women. He lectured and raised money in the North for their support. He recruited teachers to travel south to help the freed men responsibly enjoy their freedom. Logan became a bishop in the AME Zion Church in 1868 and continued his work supporting workers' rights, equal rights for women and blacks, and financial support for educational opportunities for the freedmen of the South. 
suffering from tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, Bishop Jermaine Wesley Logan went to Saratoga Springs, New York, to take the mineral water cure in September of 1872. Logan died in Saratoga Springs on September 30th, 1872. His body was brought back to Syracuse where he was buried October 4th, 1872 in Oakwood Cemetery. It amazed me that Logan was buried in Syracuse 22 years to the day of his giving perhaps one of his most widely quoted speeches, rallying the citizens of Syracuse to resist the fugitive slave law of 1850. Before I continue, I would like to give a public thank you and acknowledgement to the work of Dr. Milton Cernet for promoting and presenting valuable research and information on Reverend Logan over the years. Reading Dr. Cernet's North Star Country and Abolitionist Acts helped me immensely in fleshing out for myself who Reverend Logan was. Also, I had kept seeing references to the article, Citizen of No Mean City, but I was unable to obtain a copy of it. So on May 16, 2005, I sent Dr. Cernet a letter introducing myself to him and inquiring as to how I could obtain a copy of the article. Within two weeks, the complete article arrived to my home. Thank you, Dr. Cernet. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, I was given the opportunity to reenact Reverend Logan in June 2004 in Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania. Once I had, once I had finished reading Logan's biography and the information that I had at my disposable, disposal, back, disposal back then, I knew I had to make a pilgrimage to Syracuse, to Oakwood Cemetery, to visit his grave site and spend some time at his final resting place. In a sense, I knew I had to go to Syracuse to get Reverend Logan's permission to present what I had discovered to the audiences that would gather in Sugar Grove later that June. I knew I had to commune with his spirit. I did not then nor now try to rationally explain why I felt this way, but I knew it was something I had to do. So my wife and I traveled to Syracuse in early 2004 and visited the Onondaga Historical Association, viewed their exhibits, and then got directions to the Oakwood Cemetery. Before leaving downtown Syracuse, Stephanie and I went to Clinton Square and photographed the beautiful Jerry Rescue Monument there. Once we arrived at the cemetery, I got a copy of the 2004 historic Oakwood Cemetery Tours brochure, which was, and I got a, cop, a photocopy of the burial sites of abolitionists at Oakwood. This page included the burial sites of Samuel May, Edmonia Highgate, Joseph Sabine, Hiram Hoyt, Charles Williston, John Henry Williams, and Jermaine Logan, buried in 1898. Hmm. After some cross-checking, we were able to determine that this was Jermaine William Logan, Bishop Logan's son, and we were eventually able to locate where Reverend J.W. Logan was buried. Upon approaching Reverend Logan's resting place, overlooking an expressway, but still somehow solemn and serene, I simply sat and closed my mind to the sounds I was hearing. I simply wanted to be for a moment, to simply be in the presence of the physical remains of the man who had been the model man he saw in Frederick Douglass and Garrett Smith. My wife and I stayed at Oakwood till dusk. By all, by all accounts, the Sugar Grove Underground Railroad Convention of 2004 was a success. That's one of the uh, newspapers that heralded it. That's another one. Greg lengthened the event to two days in 2005 and 2006. And expanded the historical reenactors to include Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner Truth. I participated in all of the annual Sugar Grove conventions 
and came to be close to Greg and his family. My wife and I have been back to Syracuse and the Oakwood Cemetery for follow research several times since my first visit in 2004. I obtained copies of the newspaper articles and correspondence in the file on Logan at, Lokewood, at Oakwood a couple of years ago. Steph and I have visited Logan Park and seen the wonderful mural by London Ladd across the street from the park. We have visited the site of the Logan home, East Genesee and Pine, where there now sits a wonderful, architecturally insignificant writing. <laughs> Underground Railroad Heritage Trail sign at the site that gives information on Logan and his family and other Syracusans who were active in the Underground Railroad. Several years ago, I was contacted by a direct descendant of Reverend Logan who lives in New York City. Ms. Estelle Simmons and I have remained in contact over the years. She shared an article from the 1947 Negro History Bulletin which gave genealogical information on Logan and his descendants. About three years ago, a friend who loves to research African American history shared a website with me that has added so much more information to my Logan archives that, at first, I was overwhelmed. The site, FultonHistory.com, is a site that contains over 20 million pages from New York, State his, New York State newspapers from the early 1800s through the 1990s. The first time I visited the site and put in Logan, over 1,200 hits came up. I spent the next several weeks staying up to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning looking at articles that told of Logan's life by his contemporaries. I found newspaper articles regarding Logan's dispute with Reverend Madison, which is mentioned in his biography two announcements of fundraisers held to support Logan's work. I found Logan's published letter in remembrance of John Brown being martyred. This site alone has added immensely to my understanding of how important Logan was perceived by his contemporaries and how vile his detractors could be at times. Dr. Carol Hunter's seminal book, the only full-length biography of Reverend Logan that I know of, has been out of print for many years. After her presentation last year here in Hamilton, I redoubled my efforts to read it and found that a copy of it was in the stacks at the University of Rochester Library. I've since read the book and taken copious notes. Dr. Hunter's book has added immensely to my understanding of Reverend Logan and his times and challenged my image of who he was, what the motivation of his actions were, and added <laughs> texture to my understanding of the man. I think because I did not approach my search for the real life of Reverend J.W. Logan as a professional historian, trained in research methods and the like, but as a storyteller and reenactor, my search has centered on his spirit, his essence, as well as his exploits. To be sure, Reverend Logan's experiences and words are what I needed to know to be able to share his life with audiences. And I am grateful that so many of them have been documented and recorded for posterity. Additionally, though, when I stand to present a historical reenactment of Bishop Jermaine Wesley Logan, I want those in attendance to feel the man, his personality, his aura as well as to understand his story. I am concerned with educating my audience about the man and the times he lived in, but also about presenting the information in an entertaining way, edutainment. I have been blessed to be able to share my love and knowledge of the historical J.W. Logan with audiences these past eight years in churches, colleges, hotels, and more. Through these presentations, I have come to be keenly aware that, in one sense, what I have been sharing, essentially, are the psychic connections of my experiences and those that I believe Reverend Logan experienced. These inter intersections could rightly be called the freedom 
strong. Thank you. Mm -hmm.